Hello, David Sritsky for The Bond Experience. Welcome back. Okay, this is an interesting one and I think you're going to get a kick out of it. First of all, if you're watching this within the first few days when I release it, chances are I am still in the Bahamas celebrating 007, the 60th anniversary, but we're probably going to a few Thunderball locations. So we thought this would be the perfect video to release today while I'm still in the Bahamas. Who's we, by the way? Well, we is Donnie Waldron and I. Donnie Waldron, you probably know him from Quantum of History. He's got an incredible podcast, but did you know that he also has a YouTube channel? The YouTube channel, it's very visual. It has some very unique content. And one of the things that Donnie did that I thought was very smart, and I don't think anybody's ever done it, is this whole idea of Fleming versus film. Taking the novel Thunderball, for example, and comparing it to the movie Thunderball and going head to head with somebody in the Bond community about which one is better. What aspects of one against the other from a plot point, character, James Bond himself, the ending, all those tropes and details that we like to talk about it, but intertwining the novel and the movie. These are conversations we've had at pubs and bars, but he brings it to YouTube. So today we've got a little bit of a, a revisit of one that he posted some time ago, but he's allowing it to be on my channel. But here's the thing, go check out this one that Donnie and I do with Thunderbolt. I think you're gonna find some of the conclusions fascinating. We wanna hear about your comments below as usual, but when you're done with this one, he's done quite a few more, like Casino Royale with Luke Taggart, yeah. So he's going to be doing more of these. This is, um, consider this a, 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 an appetizer, the start of your adventure of Fleming versus film and back again. Have a look. All right, welcome in my good friend, David Zdorisky. It is fantastic to have you. Thank you for coming on and doing this. We're doing Fleming versus film. We're doing Thunderball. And I can't be, tell you how excited I am to have you on. David, welcome in. Thank you. I, it's been a little bit, man. This is great that we're getting back to do this. I know, it's great. To, and I got to tell you, I want to just, I know I've told you before, but I want to say how excited I am and how happy for I, I am of all the success you've had in the uh, recent last year and a half. And that I just, I truly love seeing people who work hard and get the fruits of their labor and seeing all the things you got to experience and all the things you got to do. I am so happy for you, David. And I'm so congratulatory. And I'm sure everyone in the community is shares my sentiment. So congratulations on all your success. We are all rooting for you. And we love that you are the patron, the grandfather of the community. <laughs> uh, wow. First of all, that is extremely nice of you. Thank you. I, I have to tell you though, I, as much as everything was crazy last year and a lot of fun. I, I'm really so happy and excited just getting back to like conversations like this, where it's, you know, I don't have to get on a plane. It's simple. You know, there's no rules and guidelines and regulations. It's just two guys talking about James Bond. I mean, that's, that's kind of what I love. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's I think what, I don't know, I can't speak for you, but I'm sure that once you get in, um, some of the, the luster kind of goes off a little bit when you kind of see how rigid things actually are. Whereas this is just a free form, which just, you're talking to little, little old quantum over here. So it's much more informal, but uh, it's, thank it's you again great. for coming on. Oh my gosh. I love it. I love it. And it's uh, you, you and I talked about this probably ad nauseum, but this is definitely my favorite Connery movie, but it's also one of my favorite Fleming books. So it's going to be interesting mm -hmm. to see how they go neck to neck. I, that's what I love about doing the Fleming versus film for these razor thin margins because a, a movie like this Thunderball and a f novel like this are both so good. Mm -hmm. And it's just what you like to present presentation of it. So that's what we're going to get into today. We're going to talk about the difference between the novel versus the film Thunderball, both classics. And Connery's my favorite by far. I love everything Connery does. He still is my go to DVD. But we're talking about Thunderball here. And we're going to talk about first, let's go ahead right into the beginning. Let's get right into it. We talk about pre straw buns, right? And what do you think about the difference between how the novel and the film present your first look at Thunderball? Yeah, I mean, I think the film, I mean, let's just call it right out. It's much more lighthearted. It's much more casual. Bond is not, you know, the wreck, if you will, that he is in the book. Um, they couldn't have it like that because people during the 60s didn't want to see somebody down and out. There was no yeah. anti-hero like Logan and things like that where you're rooting for the underdog. They wanted that person to be handsome and swarmy. So, you know, being sent off the Shrublands in the movie and being sent off to Shrublands, you know, it was almost like a diagnosis in the yeah. book. Whereas 
you know, the other way was almost like a, a, a beautiful retreat, you know, <laughs> you, right? You're going to go clear yeah. out the pipes a little bit and you're going to get even better and more swarmy and more pithy. And whereas, whereas the book, you're like, dude, you yeah. suck right now. You need to, <laughs> you need to get well. Yeah, it really is. I think they were talking 60, 60 cigarettes a day and a half a bottle of liquor a day is what Bond was going through. And Em was finally like, all right, we need we need to do something about this. Whereas yeah. the film kind of goes, all right, well, uh, like, yeah, he's on a spa vacation. It's something like you, you're doing on, on an anniversary or something. Yeah, he, you... he missed a stone. Like, but to your point, in the book, he was, you know, in almost the way Fleming painted Bond, we've got to think about that too, versus the movie, was this is a character that, may take his life. Maybe he doesn't like his situation. Maybe he doesn't like himself or what he's going through every day. Whereas in the movie, Connery always painted it as I'm having the time of my life. Yeah, I messed up on a mission, but I, I guess that's why I'm going. Yeah, exactly. So if you were to pick about what you're starting off, we'll start with the first, the first round of what you like better. The first decision to make, Mr. Zaritsky. Do you like the presentation of a down and out bond Spoking, drinking too much, or do you kind of like the "Hey, I'm chilling at the new Shrublands Bond"? I mean, judging my reaction to No Time to Die, I like um, I like my Bond to have swagger, to have yeah. confidence. Um, I like the movie version of this. I do, I, and, and I even like how it's portrayed. Where you know Bond isn't this like doughy eyed you know guy with tears in his eyes and you know cigarette stained teeth. He's still our charming debonair assassin spy agent, um, wooing women and, you know, being uh, obnoxious to bad guys and, you know, sneaking about. Whereas in the book, he's just kind of seems to be letting things happen. So I choose the movie. What about you? I'm actually going to choose the novel. I'm going to choose the novel because I, I like the guy who has done terrible things and is maladjusted, doesn't know quite how to do it, but he's still going to go do his badass stuff. I don't think it's quite as as whiny as we got in No Time to Die. I think this is more, I've been killing people and I just need to drink and smoke and I will live till I can no longer live no more. You know what? So, you know what's happening already though, Donnie? Let me call this out because let's see if this plays out in the rest of the conversation. You are probably, with what you do for a living, may have a closer affinity or understanding, relevance, if you will, of the bond in the book you know, seeing some yeah. really awful stuff and, and fighting with that. Whereas me, I'm just going to my white collar job. Dum, 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 dum. So yeah, maybe we're, we're living on those parallel paths. Oh, you, for sure. I mean, you still have stresses in that, but I can definitely relate to just coming home sometimes and just not having the emotional capacity to do it correctly and just finding a little drink here and there. So for me, I, I do like the novel bomb, but again, it, it's close in this regard. Okay. Uh, but when we get into Shrublands itself, when you look at what they were talking about with when she got there and Connery was there kind of willy nilly walking around and stuff like that. And they talk about what helped in, you know, the, the fruits and nuts, the, the actual health care of what it takes to get yourself right. What do you think about the difference between the way the, the novel portrays it or versus the way the film portrays it? I mean, the, the novel is, I'll use this word, it's almost prescriptive in nature. Yeah. They really get into the details. Um, they talk about what that type of diet will do, what that type of nutrition can do, what the deliverable is, um, why, you know, the whys behind doing it, and then obviously putting activity in there. And that really stems from, uh, Donnie, I know you and I have kind of focused on our health and wellness. I asked a lot of questions when I was in Jamaica about some of the staff that knew Fleming, and he made a study once he got to Jamaica of trying to become healthier and understanding how does food play a role in that? Now, I don't know if he stopped drinking as much or his <laughs> cigarettes. So I think he was trying to balance inappropriately both of those. But he understood that eating natural foods, having very few ingredients, as opposed to all the crap that we put into our food, having the right amount of proteins, but also you know, subjecting yourself to leafy vegetables was so important. And I think he put it in the novel. I think he saw I him. I think he saw Bond in his own reflection and said, "This is how I've gotten better." This is as as opposed to, it's an offhanded remark in uh, the movie where Money Penny says, "On yogurt and lemon juice, <laughs> good luck with that." 
<laughs> and that's all we know. It was like it's in the novel. Uh, I forget what her name is. The the caretaker that's always with uh, hmm. Bond, the Irish woman. She says, "What are you supposed to do? Same thing on on leaves and figs or whatever you're supposed yeah, to do. How are you supposed May. to be a man? Yeah, how are you supposed to be a man on on that kind of diet? I, I think that's kind of an homage to it. But I do. I think it's also interesting in the fact that this was 1950s and they still understood what it took to be a health care or what it took to actually yeah. be, you know, people have to get so, this, there's too much to it. There's really not just diet and exercise. And they kind of knew fresh fruit, nuts, raw food, non-processed food. That is the key to health. And uh, you're seeing now that it's prepackaged as the TB12 diet or Tom Brady's diet or everything else. How do you just saying it? They knew it back then. We just are poor at actually executing it. Exactly. And I think there's, you know, it's a multi-billion dollar business now, whereas before it was more about, you know, parents and family handing it down from generation to generation, but they were probably considered witch doctors. You know, what do you mean I should take six almonds a day? What do you, some sort of witch burn her? <laughs> you know, whereas now it's like, yeah, eat, eat a handful of almonds. It'll be better than eating a handful of Twinkies, for example. But, but even the Thunderbolt, the shrublands in the movie was kind of, you look back on it as a joke. I mean, the table, you know, that he gets yeah. stretched on and, and those, those big, you know, uh, boxes that they're sweating in just look a little ridiculous nowadays. Crazy, right? It's like the little, the little shimmy, the little shimmy exercise machines and stuff, like <laughs> exactly. all those things that you don't see anymore. Even I, I thought it was interesting. You wouldn't you hear it in the movie, but even the novel, they talk about the the, the the ride there and Bond's talking about the the town losing his favorite prostitute. Like just those kind of subject matter, you would never Bonkers. see in right how much he pushed the envelope. Yeah. So who do you give it to? The Shrublands? Movie or the film or uh, the novel? The novel wins this one hands down. I, I loved reading it. I loved, I think I did what you did where I sat back and said, wow, they, they got their shit together even back then in the 50s. Did you get it? Yep. We're back? Yep. Hold on. Something went wrong with the audio. We're back and we're better than ever. Oh, hold on. You're all gr grimy here. Can you talk again? Hello, hello, hello. Because over here, it's super clear. So it's recording on my side and you look clear and I look clear. But right, you can't you hear me? I can hear you. You sound like Alvin and the Chipmunks, but I'll just keep going. Oh, no. Let me, um, you, do you want to like come out of here and then come back in? Yeah, I can take the first half and then. Yeah, because you can always edit this afterwards. Yeah, perfect. Right, you're right back to where you were. Oh, you really sound like Alvin and the Chipmunks. Right now? But yeah. No, no, you're, we're perfect now. We're, we're okay. back on. Um, so, yeah, so we said that they got the shit together and that you voted for the novel on that one. And then we got, you got one movie, one novel. And then I'll cut it right here and I'll start again. I also am going to take the novel. Uh, I think this is a hands down one. I really like how they get into the complexity of it, the shrub lens, all the health and wellness as opposed to just presenting it. It makes things, uh, I appreciate the movie even more, understanding the novel, what they were trying to do with it, but still I'm giving it to the novel on this one. So now we actually get two shrub lens. And the scene that I really like, um, really, really, really yeah. like is when Bond sees him take the wrist off and he sees the tongue tattoo, right? Now, in the movie, it's kind of like, oh, he sees it, but it's not as presented as well. Whereas the novel, it really focuses on the fact that the guy doesn't want to take the watch off. And Bond, being a detective that he is, can't just let this go. He can't just be yeah. on vacation. He can't just be separated from being uh, an MI6 agent. He's always got it turned on. So the minute he sees this, his spidey senses have turn, turned up. He's like, why would this guy not want to take his watch off? It's weird. And then he sees the tongue tattoo. And instead of just letting that go, and instead of just saying, uh, that's kind of weird that he has that tattoo. He goes and investigates more. And I, I love that thing. Do you want to go into what you think about that scene? Um, I, I, I'm absolute agreement with you. I think that any time, you know, even the new Batman showed this, any time that your hero can be she seen using his intelligence instead of his brawn, you know, okay. this is a detective as well as a spy and assassin. So whenever he's using his mind to deduce things and figure them out, those are the best storylines. Like even from Russia with Love, it's a perfect example where he's using, you don't know what's going to happen. He doesn't know what's going to happen. And he's not using anything bombastic like a machine gun to figure it out. He's using his mind. That was a perfect example. The movie, on the other hand, it's almost like, like you said, he kind of plays it off. 
You know, he yeah. has a quick little research and it, it suddenly it's delivered to him on a silver platter. And again, Money Penny, you know, basically does the research for him, comes back. And, you know, I get why they did it. You couldn't have that elongated deduction. But yeah, the novel does it so well. I love it. And I love that part. Again, just not being able to turn it off to always we talk about it. Even you're either in red alert, yellow alert or green. And when you get into that field, you're never in green alert again. There's always something that you're going to yeah. see. And you're going to notice your environment. And instead of just letting it go, by chance, he stumbles upon this elaborate thing just by following his intuition. And I love that part of the story. So for me also, hands down, novel on that one. I love see, the way they present that one. And again, I'm just throwing this out to the audience uh, in case not everybody knows. But I think I think what I'm loving about what I'm seeing is you bring a lot of your experience to this conversation because... I'm sure, again, you see a lot of things and I would imagine it's almost like an itch that you can't scratch until yeah. you can figure it out. And it just haunts you and invades your personal life, your professional life. And that's exactly what Bond's doing. That's what I love about this character the most. That's what I identify the most about, especially the Connery Bond and the novel Bond is that he's a detective first and he sees these things. And, and when you when you, he sees this one thing, he just can't turn it off. He just can't let it go. Most people, would would see that and be like, oh, this dude doesn't want to take his watch off. It's weird. But Bond's like, no, there's a higher reason why this guy doesn't want to. And then this guy who has is Caucasian has a tong tattoo. That is Spidey senses allure. And I and I just I can't let that go. I had this same thing. I, w I was on Instagram one day and I had this case, same thing. And I saw something on Instagram on a guy's story because um, I had a fake one and I would investigate people using a fake Instagram. Oh. And something went off and I saw him wearing a, a, a certain article of clothing that he shouldn't be wearing. And I delved down in the rabbit hole, started looking at hashtags and all this stuff. And before you know it, I solved uh, a rash of robberies that I had just from the same thing. Your spy sense takes, takes oh off. My gosh. You see something that doesn't belong and you follow down the rabbit hole. And before you know it, you, you've solved something. So I just, for me, I loved that scene. So cool. Um, yeah, I loved it. So we get into Count Lippy, right? Uh, what do you think about that whole storyline about how Cal Lippi becomes, it's very, it's very, we talk about um, convenient storytelling, but it kind of does, it's almost believable at the part where we're struggling, but how do you think about the Count Lippi getting burned, then putting on this domino effect onto the whole rest of the plot of the story? Yeah, I mean, I, I do like that because... <laughs> It's consequential. You know, in movies, yeah. you can't show the consequences of something because you've got to move the plot so quickly. But in a book, you can do that. And this is, I mean, I think you and I talked before we started this recording. This is one of my top favorite books because the way it shows, I love how you put domino effect, excuse the pun, um, <laughs> of, of different things happening. It is, it is well done how even what he does and what is done to them from a bad guy standpoint has consequences. In the movies, especially Bond movies, they tend to show the bad guys, for example, with some malformation, um, you know, scars, all these things, but they don't really talk about how they affect them. You know, are they ostracized? Does that make them become a bad guy? In the movie, you know, you know, he's getting burned. And then the next day, he's just like, gets into the car and leaves. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> nah. you know, it's like yeah. spy versus spy. It's much more cartoony in the movie. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. What so about who, you? Who I think, I think, again, the novel, I like I like watching how these things play out. And I understand that it's a movie and there's so much, again, gravitas in the movie with the big scenes and the big fight scenes and all that, um, which lend itself better to, to, to film. But the novel, there's just something about reading this, how things play out and, and yeah. understanding it and visualizing it in yourself and how the steps play out that I just, I appreciate. And, and for this one, again, I'm giving it to the novel. See, I'm going, to, I'm going to give it to the movie, which may shock you, but after I just, yeah. you know, heralded it as something good, <laughs> because the, the the interplay between Bond and Count Lippy in the movie, to me, is some of the best Bond filmmaking. I love that there's yeah. another kind of evil agent that he's going toe to toe with, and they're not like stabbing each other in the throat the second they see them. They're trying to get one over each other. They're going after the same girl. Uh, yeah. To me, that's just pure Bond fantasy. <laughs> no, it's, it's it's closer than I, I I made it seem, but for sure I, I'm going to give it to the novel on that one. Good man. So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna leave Strublins. We're gonna move on. We're gonna move on to the Spectre meeting. Uh, 
let's go let's let's talk about the spectre meeting as an entire whole and we'll start with the way that the film does it how do you like how a lot Mili lago comes out and he's like you can't park there he's like <laughs> <laughs> like dramatic squirrel, right? Remember the dramatic. Like, Excuse me, sir. You know, like, yeah. <laughs> uh, as opposed to, let's just start with the film. How do you take the overall film goes from right from the start, from Emilio Lago showing up until he stands on the table and gives his plot? I mean, it's iconic, and it, it's so strange, Donnie. You'll appreciate this. It wasn't until I got older that I really watched that scene that I realized the whole front end where he enters is all a front. You know, they're mm -hmm. giving out loans to people that don't have to pay the loans back. And, you know, yeah. there's this whole like operation on top of operation. You understand the many levels of complication of Spectre. You get that. Um, when I was younger, I didn't know any of that. I just saw a big long table and a guy petting a cat. But I love <laughs> the, the level of intimidation. Um, I love actually that even during that scene, you see guys sweating and getting nervous. Like, you know, he's the only one cool as a cucumber, Largo. And, you mm -hmm. know, this guy's a standout. So... I think it introduces him extremely well. And I think it shows him as, dare I say, is this the bad guy equal to Bond? Yeah, I really like how the movie does it. And I really, as with all, all movies, all Bond movies in that area, the era, the Ken Adams scene, when, oh. when, they have, when they shoot that shot from the floor as he walks up and then you kind of see the entire room and you see it, it's just, it's, I love the spectacle of the early movies. Because you know they had to build those things. It's not yeah. it's not CGI or anything. There's just something romance romantic about seeing a well crafted, well thought out, beautifully designed. And I think it really encapsulated the mood of what it was. I agree. And we go. Let's flip over now to the novel side. Now let's talk about how the novel introduces and goes about Spectre meeting. Yeah, and honestly, it's almost hard for me to remember. I do remember there was a lot of exposition, a yes. lot of talking a lot of details, a lot of names. And I think that's why it's hard for me to grapple with it because the movie one was so digestible. It was so quick, but you got exactly what you needed to take the journey of the next two hours. Whereas the book went into like a lot of specific details and it gives you a lot of storyline and plot, but that was Fleming. Fleming would go on for like pages on end des describing the, the wood grain of a table. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I think that it was interesting to see that one was a drug money that you were kind of skimming off the top from in the movie. Mm. Whereas in the novel, it was that somebody unsullied uh, captive and the professionalism of which Spectre held is that we needed to, we need to hold our reputation above all else. So when we promised the ransom to be paid and then we wouldn't have an unsullied um, captive woman be brought back to it, we ended up reimbursing the ransom money because that's not what Spectre is about. So I thought that was interesting. Mm. Uh, and I thought that that was, again, another Fleming thing that you wouldn't think would push the balance of what was acceptable to even write about or talk about at the time. Although the novel is very good, I give it to the movie on this one for sure. Wow. Yeah, I mean, me too. The, yeah, because I, I just love that scene. I love the presenting. And again, you can kind of get lost in the words and, and a lot of the backstory, whereas this is, here's the presenting, here it is. Although I do like the 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 nuance of the the new film better or the novel better, I, I'm going to give it to the movie on this one. There you go. Who are you giving it to? I'm going to I'm going to give it to the movie. movie. It's so iconic. I, I mean, I love what we're talking about. Is the the book will always give you the dimensionality mm. um, of of having a more rich, colorful story, of course, because it's a book. But uh, there's just something that sits with you in the movie. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So let's get into the part where the, the Spectre plot actually starts unfolding. So we've got Patachi's flight to the Bahamas and the way it's going to be, again, a, a preference of how you like it played out. The novel goes into a long depth thing of everything that Patachi's going through. And he talks about uh, turning the knobs as he's flying, like a delicate as a, a delicate as the trigger points of a woman, which I just, yeah. I just love that line. Um, as opposed to the film, this is very much canister. Here we go. We're landing. Right. Uh, what would what, what do you think about the actual flight? Yeah. So um, I love the novel version of this, and I remember reading it. And of course, I, it's been years of seeing the movie. Which I will say, as much as I love the movie Thunderbolt, that's kind of the time, uh, except for Fiona. Um, that's the time where I'm kind of like, I could go to the bathroom. You know, mm -hmm. the, their whole thing when they're eating sandwiches. And would you like to come up here for a better view? And the whole yeah. gas canister. It's okay. It's fine. It tells a plot. 
but the the story the novel really goes into the details of this man is on a mission you know yeah there's there's greed and subterfuge and all these things going on but he has his own finesse and in the movie you don't get that you almost think that this guy's a patsy you know he's just mm -hmm. being used whereas in in the in the novel again it, it becomes more human if that makes sense yeah. I agree. And he talks about the fact that he just killed everybody in the in the cockpit a little more. And he talked about the, the flying with the bodies and, and how macabre that whole feeling is mm -hmm. and how, how his flight path even goes into rather than how does he even get there? There's no exposition about that. He just gets to the Bahamas, whereas this is, hey, we, we weave in with the commercial flights. No one notices. We're going through this time because we can fly under the radar and nobody in the Bahamas at night is working. They're sleeping on the job anyways. So they're not even going to notice us coming up here. Um, exactly. Yeah. So on this one, where you, who, where are you voting, novel or film? I'm giving it to the novel. Woo! woo. Novel gets I, one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give it to the novel as well. Yeah. Right now, David, you're actually three to three, novel versus film, and I'm four wow. to one, novel. Yeah. Whoa. I, I did this with uh, when I did this with Thomas Felix Crane. Same thing. He thought he, we were going through all the things, and at the time, I'm like, you're almost tied. He's like. But I love the film so, or the novel so much better. How is this happening? So it's funny how you go piece by piece. And, and, yeah, and, it's like a psychological uh, path. It's so strange. Yeah. And I also like how once he lands, Vargas is the one that does the killing. It gives more to Vargas as the cold-hearted killer that they're trying to portray in the movie, Yeah. where I think that he doesn't do anything in the movie. So Vargas is kind of lost where having, in, instead of having the, the, the oxygen tank caught and call it a day, Vargas actually goes down there and just kills him with the knife, which yeah. is a far more in your face. You have to be a cold, cold person to do that. Um, but just little things on that. No, I love you, it. And once we get to Largo on the boat, mm -hmm. here's, here's a fascinating topic. And I thought that was kind of um, good that Bond sees it and there's, the, the people see Largo on this and they see all these alpha guys. They see all these guys who gravitas and, you know, they walk into a room and they own it. And then they see one nerdy scientist and everyone goes, why is that nerdy dude hanging out with that card? Uh, what do you think about the difference? Because it's never really talked about in the film as much, but in the novel, they make a big point about why is this dude hanging out with that? So what, what do you think about that presentation, that little plot point to send off your spidey senses, as they say? I think it's good. I think it's just, it adds to the armament of people and not just Bond, but others trying to deduce what is really going on here. And I think it also, Fleming does something in the novel that you can't really do in the movie, which he shows that it's not what's on the top two layers of what's happening that is the most intriguing and most important. It's what's underneath. And you've got yes. to constantly, constantly be digging. And just when you think you're far enough into the dirt, you probably have to dig even farther. And I think those types of ob observations about, you know, the all these, like you said, alphas, you know, with this kind of, you know, uh, simple guy, you know, just standing there, this geeky guy. What is this? One of these things is not like the others. Yeah. Where in the film, when I bring up kind of the scientists and things like that to people, like, you know, how he turns in the end and becomes good. People are like, what scientist? I'm sorry. Yeah, exactly. Was there, was, there, was there a scientist? Did I yeah, miss that? It, for sure. They don't even, it, the, I think the film does a poor job of really bringing out that point. But it's also just different because it's harder. I get it. But I really, really like that point. It's just one of those things, like you said, that's a perfect analogy that here's the surface thing. You can see that it's kind of weird, but you could either take it at first value. Like, ah, maybe they're just hanging out with this dude. He's kind of funny. Or start digging. And then once you start digging, you realize, okay, this really doesn't make sense. Exactly. So they get to, Felix comes into the picture now. And now they go to the Palmyra, Palmyra, Palmyra uh, yacht, right? Yeah. And that whole conversation, so I'm going to group both that scientist and the meeting between Leiter and Bond with or Largo on the yacht with everything else. Okay. So what do you think about the difference between that sneaky Bond going out and checking out Palmer a lot and going under the water and seeing all this stuff as opposed to going out and pretending in the, in the, in the novel that, hey, we're trying to buy Palmyra and we're trying to figure out if there's a nuclear bottom on that by using this whole other alternative uh, ident identification. I mean, I love, this was where things really deviated, as you know, you know, novel and book. So I love the almost like alternate in universe. It was almost like a Marvel comic. What if, 
you know, what if they decided to do it like this? I love the partnership with Felix and Bond and the playoff with each other, because again, it gives them something else to do. Whereas in the movie, you know, Felix, especially in Thunderbolt, is kind of just, you know, he's just a guy that supplies things. He's driving yeah. Miss Daisy, he gets a helicopter, he's takes Bond around, but he doesn't have a ton of things to do. Um, now, that being said, here's the problem you're going to have with measuring this. Uh, I love that part of the movie. I mean, to me, this is where Thunderbolt excels, yeah. is where you have this kind of, you know, I, I'm going to sneak around, I'm going to connect, and then, boom, in the next scene, I'm shooting skeet guns with you and, you know, trying to bed your niece, so to speak. <laughs> um, I love those. Are, those, to me, are the Connery moments where Connery could be an action star as well as an international playboy and an undercover person at the, all at the same time. Mm, absolutely. I, the, the deviation happens and it, it is, I, I love them both for what they are. And it almost like you have to accept that what works best in one medium is not going to work best in the same medium. Yes. So you've got what really works well, that whole dialogue and coming on and, and trying to, you can just write what they're thinking and say that, Hey, there's a sneaky thing. And Laura goes looking at him this way. And Felix is looking at him this way where it's very hard to convey that on the film. Oh yeah. So as it deviates, but like you say, they never, they never do Felix justice in the first ones. And Fleming always writes so affectionately about Felix. He really yeah. p pulls him out as a character. And in this film, again, he's a throwaway character. But if you're going to pick between which way you like, do you like the deviation between seeing the sneaky bond and seeing him go out and do all this other stuff versus really kind of more dialogue and thought. If you're going to pick one, what's it going to be? I'm picking the movie one. <laughs> I, I figured. This is, this is what I love about that film. It's, it's, it's hard to go head to head with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to go with the movie on that one as well. Wow. I, I really like what they do. I really like, I, I, I think it's appreciative of the times and how you could get away with doing that and saying that you're a real estate agent. But something about seeing Bond on film and do all these cool things and, and even the sharks, right? Maybe the sharks are a little cheesy, but I do love the sharks. And I, the way that he talks about Domino. What do you think about Domino? And this is going to be just a character-based mm. one. Domino film versus Domino novel. Ooh, that is, that is a big, good question. Um, so, I mean, obviously, you know, it's interesting too, when I did the book club and we talked about Domino, I think people that were reading it for the first time were really surprised about the novel version because I think they were expecting something radically different, like a lot more, a lot more complicated, a lot more layers. And I think, I think you did, but it was still a femme fatale. You know, it was so somebody who was, you know, under pressure. Um, the movie version, she, uh, look, she's one of my favorite Bond girls, but, you know, let's face it, most of it was eyeball candy um, yeah. until the very end when she kind of took matters into her own hands and, you know, she actually got to kill Largo. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the problem with the, not, the movie one is that the way she's acted is the cute, you know, pretty Bond girl, as opposed to in the book, there's a little bit harder edge history to it. There's a little bit more revenge factor, I think, when push comes to shove. Um, but yeah, this one, this one's going to be very close. Yeah. I like in the film, uh, the, the way that they physically describe her, she seems more like Martine Beswick, I think. The way they describe her uh, mm. olive skin and all the dark hair. But I think the way that they talked about Bad Story in the novel, I think that it's reminiscent of the times. The way I picture it and the way I would put myself back in the times is that in order to get into those circles as a young, beautiful woman, to get into those circles with these rich, elite men, it almost feels like you have to kind of give part of yourself to it, right? And there's got to be some kind of seedy thing you're not proud of. Yeah. And it seems every no every Fleming novel that I've, that I've read, it seems like Fleming is cognizant or wary that when a man sees a young woman with an older man or, or a powerful man to understand that that didn't come for free, that came with a price. And there's a whole backstory to that. And Bond's very good about placating to that, that darkness that she had to endure in order yeah. to get to that circle. And, and I find that very interesting in, in the novels. That's a really good point because in the movie, it's, it's absolutely hinted at, you know, when she says, you know, you know, niece, you know, as opposed to kept women and, and she even apologizes for that, 
You know, she yeah. says I, it sounds better than kept woman or whatever. And he goes in a very charming way. Well, I wouldn't have said that, you know, <laughs> but I think it's hinted at, which is very avant-garde for the sixties to have mm -hmm. even flirted with that whole idea because they were just so puritanical in the movies about showing those types of relationships. But I guess in that case, they really wanted to show Largo as going against the fundamentals of the family values. Yeah, yeah, very much so. I do like how she plays it. They, they do touch upon it. Um, but as a character as a whole, I think there are times in, in the novel too where Domino becomes very long-winded. There are times when um, she talks about that cigarette pack for seems like for pages and pages about this guy in a cigarette pack who she idolizes as a hero. Or even when they first meet, she's trying to quit smoking as opposed to diving. And Bond goes, why don't you buy a pack of light cigarettes? But in my experience, it's better to just try to quit altogether. Um, I think that there's better to that, but I still, I don't know. I don't know. It's going to be razor thin on this one too. I mean, for me, yeah, I, I, I have to go with the movie version. Just because it's, it's such a good encapsulation. Um, I mean, that is domino to me. Yeah. I agree. And when I see the novel, sometimes I think, oh, they could have done this right. Or I feel like now when I watch the film, I'm like, you know what? Cloudy Nogger, the way they do it, the way they play it, and uh, not as long winded. I just, I'm going to give it to the movie just because the tiebreaker for me is that. The bathing scene. suit? <laughs> you know me so well, David. <laughs> it's got to be the side move. It, it's that, that, you know, you get that, that sachet across the time with mash. What the hell? So, I mean, I mean, I'm sorry. To me, that is one of the best looks, and it has nothing to do with nudity. Look, nowadays, if we want nudity, we go online and you get every flavor of nudity you want. It has to do with the fact that she wore that, and people did wear those things in the '60s, and she pulls it off perfectly. It, uh, it's just fantastic. Absolutely, I agree. Absolutely, um, but yeah, that's that's a tiebreaker for me. And then we talk about, so the, the Felix and Bond, they finally get enough things in the novel and, and a little bit in the movie too, but they finally get enough things that this is our guy, right? We know that Largo, it's w w without a shadow of a doubt, mm -hmm. and they start to get that ball rolling. And one of the things I love in um, the novel is he talks about the wisp of grasping at straws, right? And Bond is very careful not to spend too much time or too much eagerness sending to M saying, hey, we got this guy because he understands how everyone at the headquarters is dying to hear any kind of news yeah. that this is in order. And he kind of keeps it on the low, keeps it up the like that, as opposed to the movie where Bond kind of is like, all right, round up, boys, we're ready to roll this. What do you think about the buildup as we, as we get into the plot in from suspicions to this is our guy? Yeah, I liked it. I mean, First of all, it sh the novel shows Bond in this particular version in being careful and cautious because he's been a little bit burnt by the home office. I mean, you know, look at what's transpired. He had to go to Shrublands. I mean, he's not, he's kind of on the mend, if you think about that psychologically and physically from what he's been gone going through. So he's been bitten. And I think part of that is, do I want to launch, you know, this, overzealous type thing without really checking my work yeah. twice and three times. And I think it shows a more judicious, careful, cautious bond um, that doesn't look at, you know, here's the thing about the movies. Connery always looked black and white. You know, we're the good guys 100%. They're the bad guys 100%. This bond in this novel sees it as gray. And he's yeah. like, they can be as bad as, as we can be and vice versa. The novel... I look, it is just calling the cavalry. You're right. It's like he might as well blow the trumpets. You know, he gets you involved. He gets, you know, hundreds of divers. They come flying from from nowhere. You know, they they have an attack. There's an investigation. I mean, it's it's balls to the wall. But I think in a movie, you've got to pay that off to the cinema because can you imagine like having him do all checks and balances in a movie? People would fall asleep. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. It's it's a it's a taste of mediums, right? Yes. But I just love that because I remember Again, something you talked about earlier about drawing up on the experience. I know that, you know, when you have a high profile case and I made the mistake one time as a rookie detective saying, hey, I think I got a suspect, but we'll see. I'll let it play out. Before I know it, I've got all the heads of staff calling. All right, give me what you got. Give me what you got. We're going to get this going. We're going to put this out. Also, I'm, like, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. I'm not ready. And it's, it's, 
it just harkened back to that same feeling where you know exactly. And I, I feel like Flash Fleming writes, he's gone through these things, same thing, being in talent. He knows that if you give even the slightest bit of straw for them to grasp that, they'll pull it out and, and call it. Exactly. But it is a taste of mediums. So what would you like? What, what's your flavor, sir? Do you like the, 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 the novels long drawn out? Or do you like, boom, let's grab your orange jumpsuit, David. We're shooting some spears. You, this might surprise you. I really like the novel version of this. Ooh. I like, I know, I it, it sounds crazy and like I'm flipping, but I just, I like the version where Bond is is thinking about, again, consequences of his actions. So yeah, I'll give it to the novel. What about you? Oh, novel, novel for sure. I, I feel like when I was reading that scene, I feel like I've been there. It's so, it's so cool. It's so cool. I, I just love that. So for sure, even though I do love seeing the coolness, I, and especially for the 1960s, you look at what it must have taken to, to pull that off. Oh my God. For the underwater cameras. I know they had this special company in Miami make all these special divers yeah. to the movie. Like what, what, I appreciate, like I, I talked to in the beginning, right? I, I appreciate your success. I appreciate looking at someone where you can tell they put the effort in and how much work it took to get there. So yeah. I always want to give deference to that. But, I, go ahead. Good, good. But for me, I'm picking a novel. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, as you should. And I was just going to follow up on what you were saying about the 1960s and those scenes, because I think a lot of people ding and dent Thunderball for the underwater scenes, thinking that they're slow and plotting if you really take the time to see them as its own like war entity yes you're not having brave hard people like charge into each other like every war movie now has a charging scene where you see people <laughs> and horses and who can have the most blood this is slower and it's more slow going but honestly if you watch little things are happening to individual people i mean people are yeah. getting things through their eyes getting their throats cut i mean it's a brutal individual human scene I agree. It's very, it's very violent for what it is, but yeah. it also, I think that the lack of a score, I mean, the score is there, but I feel like the cutscenes in, in, in a, a louder score or a bigger score or more music or more sound effects would add to that. I think the part that I would criticize of the film is that in that time, you're not giving the emotions with the sound effects or That's true. You're, you're, you're underwater. How much, how much sound effects can you actually put? Yeah, but the score and that it kind of lets it down because it doesn't give you that gravitas moment. It's more like, oh, there's people snorkeling and you're going slowly to begin with because you're underwater. We need so the I Hans Zimmer Brahm, like the Brahm. <laughs> you know, I I love me some Hans. He won he won the Oscar again last night. I know. Not so for, happy not, for them. <laughs> um, so last thing, why why wasn't why was uh why was would you take give anything back to see Fiona Volpe in the, not in that movie? Oh my god, no. Uh no. I would I would get <laughs> I would get rid of other Bond movies just to make sure that she she stays within that movie. She's that masterful. Question. Yeah. I, I love it. I feel like it's they added her and it's such we, we talk about a lot of times whether Fleming got it right or Boyle Dome got it right. The addition of Fiona Volpe in the film as opposed to the absence of the novel is such a it's it's a, it's a 10 point bonus it right is. for for me because i think Fiona Polpe just added so much to that the femme fatale and the blue dress when she does the little hanging over the edge at the and when you first introduce her and her whole part throughout the whole movie even the way she drives fast which is very fleming-esque yes uh, when she picks them up i i i'm gonna give a five point bonus just just for Fiona Polpe for the film to, to me, she is a combination of like Paloma uh, on a top. You know, she's got the sensuality, but she's got the danger and she's got the fun factor. So she brings three things of our favorite Bond women to the table, Bond girls, um, to the table. And she does it with such class. I never feel like, because, you know, during the 60s, people could be dangerously close to overacting. Yeah. I never felt like she was really acting. She just felt so natural and everything. And she was an equal to Bond in many ways. She wanted she wanted to kill Bond like she was a tigress. Yeah. Um, no, just come on. Perfect. <laughs> and I was when I was introduced about why Bond is so cool, a lot of times I'll put him onto that scene where Bond and Fiona Volpe are in bed. And she's like, uh, talk, talk, talk. All you do is talk. Right. And he's like, you should be caged and all this other stuff. I'm like, that whole 
cool sex. I mean, that is exactly how the coolest part of the 60s is that kind of bra- bra- bravado in that scene. So a lot of times when we're like, right, well, why do I love Bond? Sometimes I'll just show people that scene and be like, this is why I love Bond. Because you don't, you know, just the coolness of that scene. Yeah, and I'm going to seem like a dinosaur, but I think you'll be right there with me as a velociraptor in the sense that <laughs> I want Bond 26 to have that more of that. Yes. You know, more of like, you know, look, Bond is, you know, often bored with his life when he's not killing somebody. But more than that, he uses, and this is a fact, you know, spies and agents have to use their sensuality and their sexuality mm-hmm. to get their job done. Yes. And, the, you know, it's not something where it's like, well, he's just, you know, being evil and how dare he do that? It's like, no, 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 guess what? And you know who does it more than men spies? Women spies. So... Yeah. Everybody hit the brakes. Yeah, absolutely, and and that's what it is. Even if you, even if it's not for the sex alone, even to try to use your charm or personality in order to get somebody to like you, in, in Casino Royale, he did a perfect example of a nuance of it when he walks to the when he flirts with the desk clerck at uh, at the one and the only. only club. Yeah, yeah, the one and only club. You don't have to have this overt, you know, grab somebody by the hair and, and make out. You can just have that scene, flirt with them just enough, a little coy back and forth to get exactly what you want. And, and I do, I hope they bring that aspect of Bond back in, into Bond 26. Yeah. I love it. That's a great point, David. So we're going to get to the finale now. Yeah. Now, <laughs> there's a lot to, to, to go in here, but we're going to start just, we'll start from the finale from the boat onto the way that they, he, she was supposed to go onto the deck and sunbathe in the novel to show yeah. off, as opposed to in the film, they just kind of like, all right, well, it's kind of the boat chase and you caught with the counter. How do you think how everything folds out? Which one are you going to give to? Yeah. So I really like the novel because, and again, when I reread it for the book club, I forgot that, you know, her going up on the sun deck, her doing all these things was really a signal. I mean, mm-hmm. she would start, you know, a yes or no, like, uh, is the Geiger counter going off? Is it happening? Is it not happening? And there were some nail biting moments. You know, when she couldn't do it and she couldn't get there and something, there was an obstacle in the way. And I I felt, dare I say, as I'm reading the novel, like nervous, like, come on, come on, you can do this. I'm like rooting. Whereas with the boat, it just, it seemed like, here's the boat scene. You know, here's yeah. kind of the special effects scene. Um, I really do like the ending in the movie when she, you know, shoots Largo in the back. But again, you get that rear projection that takes me out of it every single time. But the novel just has this wonderful way of pushing the story forward and making, this is what it is. It makes the audience slash reader feel something, feel yeah. nervous, feel anxious, uh, feel uh, like they're rooting for somebody. And the movie version doesn't quite do that for me. I agree. I, I think that starting from the sea urchins, when she, she comes out of the water and, and she's gets the bond sucks the urchins out of her foot and then he was, you know, was hooking up. And then at the end, he tells, you know, that my brother's dead. And she's like, well, you know what? We were going to do this anyways. And it doesn't have, you feel it more in the novel, whereas it almost feels throwaway in the film. And the boat scene almost seemed like a foregone conclusion. Like, all right, there's the boat. We know we're, we know we're ending there. Whereas the novel, it feels like, all right, are we going to get there? Is she going to get up? How is it going to know where to do this? Are we going to make the yeah. move? There's so many implications. This is worldwide, you know, one wrong move one way. We can have an entire city blown up or we can start another world of war with something else. Yeah. Uh, there is a much more suspense. For the back protection on the film, I give it a pass. And I understand. Good. I give it a pass because. I understand that they had all these things to do. They had a year and a half to do it, which in imagine trying to make that movie now in a year and a half. It seems like yeah. that's unspeakable. And what they had for resources left, the time they had to set, they're like, all right, we've got to pick and choose what we're going to put our efforts in. We're going to have to deal with back projection and call it a day. Now, watching it in 2022, it's like, wow, that's really bad. But it's I, just slow it down a little bit. That's all yeah. I'm saying. Because it's like it's like the Keystone Cops. Like, da, 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 da. It's like no. But I, I, so I do give that a pass. But I will say, I appreciate at the ending when Bond feels like he's at, underwater and he's at his last end and he cannot move anymore. He's completely physically exhausted from the fight. And Largo's come to kill him, and then he sees the, the shadow of of domino in the water killing him 
and then helping them back to safe and, and, and bringing that up. I like that ending more than her just coming up from the thing, shooting yeah. with, the, with the back projection. So for those reasons, I'm going to give the ending to the novel. I'm, I'm doing the same thing, man. Well, you, the, the final tally here between the two. I'm nervous, I'm, dude. I'm actually really <laughs> nervous. Five, five, you, novel versus film. No, it's not yeah. even. Yeah, five five, and I'm six four novel. So it, it was, it was razor thin, David. Razor thin. I, but again, I picked the topic, so who knows? Maybe if you picked the topic, you would have come out with something. Dude, different. this is disturbing. <laughs> we had the same thing. With, we had the same thing with Felix. Is that when you take different parts together, a lot of times you're surprised the fact that you like more of the singular parts of one. When you thought you would have liked more yeah. of the other, even though you liked the other one. So what's the final verdict? What would you say? You got a choice. You're gonna pick. All right, I can. I, I have to live with one, or not. Never have to live with the other. You pick the film, or you pick in the novel. Despite my tie score, how embarrassing! Um, I am picking the film. I have to. It's like it's like my number two, like <laughs> Bond film. So I'm I'm still gonna pick the film because to your point, I love how you put this as a whole yeah. if i think about it as a whole like if i read the novel from beginning to end and if i watch the movie from beginning to end which one gives me the most joy the most pleasure that could be repeatable it's going to be the movie mm -hmm. that's a very good point again what is your big you, we talked about this earlier before we even recorded what is your fun moment what is the thing you enjoy what is your escapism that we all yes. look for in bond and i think thunderball is a good I am huge on Thunderball too. I think that Ooh. it's one of the, I'm, I, I say that the film, Bond films are six perfect tens and Thunderball I think is one of them. I just, I love Thunderball. And it's funny that you said that you said that the film is your second favorite film. So how could you not pick the film? I have the same problem with other ones where I had From Over Love was my second favorite film, but I still picked the novel, even though the novel is one of my top ones. So it came down for me, tough decision. Tough decision, razor thin. Again, I love Thunderball for the escapism. I love it to put on my Sunday afternoon, all that stuff. But overall, I'm still gonna take the movie. I'm gonna take the movie. Yes. I love the movie. <laughs> all is all is right in the world. <laughs> no, I love the novel, but if I'm gonna pick what I had, there's something about Thunderball, and there's something about the escapism and all the joy that I have in escaping from that. And yeah, a lot of times some of Thunderball, the novel is is dark and you kind of get into that area where it's not as much escapism where i look at thunderbomb like this is what i this is what i want to do i want to go yeah. to an island i want to hunt a bad guy hang out with some beautiful girls call it a day and and, and leave in my wrap at the end it, it's so true and you know one thing we didn't get to talk about but i'm sure you talk about with each one of these novels versus movies is visual. Like in, yep. in Thunderbolt, the movie, the visuals to me are half the joy, you know, seeing, mm -hmm. you know, the, the Atlantis, you know, and seeing, you know, the Bahamian areas and uh, the beautiful things that don't have anything to do with plot. They, they're just yep. all visual. They, they immerse you into the location and the moment. The novel, you could talk for 16 pages. You're still not going to get that input that your brain, eye and ear are giving you i agree absolutely and it's one of those reasons why i love the story of goldfinger but i don't get the aesthetics that i get with thunderball and dr no just being able to aesthetically watch that and escape into the time and yeah. you have the the even the dance scenes in the film where you have yeah. piano volpe dancing in the ballroom and being brought in from your yacht on the boat like it's bougie but it's 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 it's, it's uh it's something that you know you want to inspire you almost want to be in that yeah. moment with him so, did you yeah. do dr no yet I have not. I have not. I've See, only done. That's going to be an interesting one. Um, I would definitely come back for that because if, if 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 you have somebody to do it with, that's fine. But to me, those the novel and the movie are so different. But I love the fantasy aspects of both the novel and the movie. So they do go really, really head to head. Yeah, absolutely. And first of all. David, who am I going to say? Oh, David's a risky. No, I've got somebody better than David. So no, you can. No, no of course not. anybody's no, better. No, of course. I don't care. So. Of course not. You, yeah, I can't wait. I'd love to do as many as you want to do. I love these. I, and I love the debate because I think it's, it's, it's interesting to see the reason why people like Bond, especially, yeah. the, you know, us with the sickness of, of Bond aficionados. It's interesting to dive into the psyche of somebody and see what really 
um, they enjoy so much. And when you can have appreciation of both the film and the novel, it's uh, it's great. It's uh, never fun. It's never not fun to discuss. And it's you... never, never, never a bad time anytime you get to hang out with David Zaritsky. Shut up. That's so. But it's it's <laughs> true of me with you. I was going to recommend if um, with Doctor No, maybe we could just do it in person, like humans. You know, I've you know what I'd really love to think about doing, uh, a, like a live event where you have people in person, like watching us do a debate and then make the entire episode having like, again, like a gather all, but then at the end having a stage where we, we debate something like this and then having interactions and have a whole live feed, maybe a couple of camera angles. And all now that we got to do it. I, I, I would love to do a production like this. I think these would be great for a, a traveling production like that. I absolutely so, think so. All right. Well, we're going to have to, we're going to have to talk. Yes. To David, we got a plan. <laughs> well, thank you so much, David. As always, it's always a privilege to talk to you. It's always so much fun. Continued success, continued your, your look at them. El Padron, El Padron, thank you so much for everything you do and continued success. I am so happy for you and I'm sure that so many of us share the same sentiments. Thank you, brother. And thanks for what you're doing and thanks for inviting me. This was, this was a nice, wonderful hour escape for me as well. <laughs> well, back to reality, right? So thank you so much, David. Until next time and we'll have to talk some more. But thank you so much for doing this. Until next time, it's been Clown with History, Fleming versus Film with special guest David Zariski. We've got the verdict. Thunderball of Film wins. Leave, leave a comment and let me know. DM me. Tell me your gripes and uh, I'll pass them on to David. <laughs> Please do. Thanks for watching this episode. If you want to be up on the latest from the Bond experience, just click on this subscribe and subscribe to our channel. You're going to get all the latest and greatest information plus some exclusive content. And by the way, speaking of content, here's something especially for you just because we know you. Talk to you soon.